3. Okay, First Peter chapter uh, 3. Right, one of the most famous incidents of the war in Afghanistan. It uh, occurred in a place called Helmand Province. So I think we've all heard of Helmand Province, haven't we? So this famous incident took place, Helmand Province, late, I think it was 2006. So some members of the Parachute Regiment, they were based near a strategic dam in Helmand. And uh, they set out on patrol because they were trying to locate some Taliban fighters who had been taking pot shots at their camp during the night. Well, what was to happen next would prove life-changing for some of these soldiers. Because as this patrol moved further and further away from the camp, all of a sudden they realized their mistake because they stopped, looked round, and immediately all they could see around them were IEDs scattered all around them, improvised explosive devices in the soil. This patrol had wandered into the center of a deadly, vast, unmarked minefield. Well, if you got up this morning, came to church without any thought to the portion of Scripture that we might be studying today, then you would be forgiven for feeling similar to how those soldiers uh, must have felt at that moment, right? Because these verses that we've just read in God's Word, verses that largely focus on a Christian wife's submission to her husband, you're with me when I say that these are some of the more controversial verses in God's Word, certainly from the standpoint of the Western mind. These are verses that have been manipulated to justify the mistreatment and abuse of women throughout the centuries. These are verses that many people in the church, if we're honest, wish weren't in the Bible and love to ignore. Well, I think we could be forgiven for thinking that we have unwittingly this morning wandered into a veritable minefield. Well, thankfully, just as that patrol in Hellman province, they could look to their commanding officer for guidance and for help at that moment. We can do the same, can we not? What do we believe? We believe that the Holy Spirit, by grace this morning, He can and will surely chart our course through this verse and through these verses, through this section of Scripture. And let me just spell out what we're going to do, because I know some are visiting, and some maybe are tuning in for the first time. So what we tend to do at London City Presbyterian Church, we'll take a section of Scripture like this, but we will maybe highlight some headings, or we'll mention some headings that will help us to highlight various points here. So that's our usual practice. Today will be slightly different. The hope this morning is that in each of these headings, we will look to Christ. So we'll stop off at various points, but in each one, as we end each point, we look to our Savior and friend, and indeed, we look to the cross. So if you've got this text, 1 Peter 3, in front of you, I think it'll be important to have it if you can uh, have an eye on it. And the first heading is simply this, an examination of submission an examination of submission. Okay, so I'm saying these are, you know, controversial words. What are they? Wives, Christian wives, be subject. Be subject to your own husband. I'm I'm saying that's controversial. Is, I think, isn't it? In a way, um, when Catherine and I got married on our wedding day, our minister at the time he chose to preach on this theme of Christian wives uh, submitting to their husbands. My unbelieving friends at the wedding were just up in arms, and I'm pretty sure that they would have stormed out of that wedding if it weren't a kind of terrible thing to do to storm out of your friend's uh, wedding. But what if we stripped away all of our baggage? What if we got rid of all our preconceived ideas and we thought not about how society views this, but what does it actually mean biblically for a Christian wife to be subject to her husband? Okay, well, over the last few weeks, we've thought a lot about what it does mean to be subject. Why don't we spin that on its head, flick it 
on its head. Here, why don't we just think about three things that Peter doesn't mean? And I think if we think about the negatives, three things that Peter doesn't mean here, it'll help us to really understand this teaching. Okay, so just follow me under this heading. The first one is this. The idea of submission here is not the idea of forced domination. Does that sound odd? Forced domination? Maybe it does sound a little bit weird, so I'll just put it to you. I'll ask you'll think I'm mad, but I'll ask the the most simple question imaginable, not to try and patronize anyone. It's not a trick question either. Here's my question. Who is Peter writing to? Right at this point in the letter, it's not silly. It's really not a ridiculous question. It's important. Who is he writing to when he says, wives, uh, be subject to your own husbands? Who's he writing to? He's writing to Wives, Christian wives, what does that mean? It means he's not writing to husbands. Now, I think that's really important. Don't you see how it's important? So, Scripture, unlike maybe other religions and other ideologies in the world just now, Scripture is not here saying, men, make sure that your wife is subject to you. And it's not saying, husbands, you get, you get your home in order, you're the head of the household, you make sure that your wife is subject to you. It's not that, it's not the teaching here. The idea here is much more the idea to the wives of a voluntary submission, a willing submission to the wife, not something that is imposed from outside the woman. Second thing that this is not, this is not the idea of accommodation accommodation. Um, When I was at university um, a million years ago in Edinburgh, I uh, took, I enrolled in a number of courses in feminist theology, so feminist readings of Scripture. I wanted to just hear what was being said by other voices. And it is very common in that sort of setting to see these verses very directly paralleled with the other verses that we have just read this morning. Now, you're going to have to stick with me, but I do think this is really important. So, you're imagining you're in a feminist theology tutorial uh, just now. This is the sort of thing you would hear. Now, think about it. That slaves are told to submit to their masters despite the fact that slavery is clearly a sinful, wicked system. So, the feminist theologian would say, wives are told to submit, but we should understand Peter as simply accommodating to a wicked, sinful system of patriarchy in the first century world. Does everybody follow the logic? You know, this is like Peter accommodates with slaves. You know, slaves, you submit to your masters, though we know that slavery is sinful. Same thing follows for a woman. You know, a wife, yeah, 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 I'll submit. But that's just Peter accommodating to wicked patriarchy. In the, the, and then what does it follow? It follows just as the Christians should have nothing to do with slavery. We've progressed in the 21st century, so now a wife doesn't have anything to do with submitting to her husband. Do you see, do you follow the logic at least? What's the problem with it? The problem is that these marital roles in Scripture, unlike slavery, the marital roles are given by God a theological foundation. Don't we know that? What does Paul say elsewhere? It's not that these things are sinful, not that they're wicked, but they reflect Christ's relationship with his church. Very different slavery, completely different slavery. And do you see what this means? It means that now, as a Christian in the 21st century, we just can't wipe this away and say, oh, this is just accommodation to a sinful system. No. These roles of a, of a man sacrificially loving his wife, of a wife submitting to her husband, this is part of God's plan today, a part of his plan to bring glory to his own son. So it's not forced domination, neither is it accommodation. The third thing that this is not is that this is not inequality. 
Now, I would ask you to do this if you've got the Bible. I would ask you to jump ahead to the last verse that we look at. So look into verse 7 here, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 7. So you can see that verse 7 is where he begins to tackle husbands. And guys, we're going to get into that in a, a moment or two. But look what he says about halfway through the verse of the wife and the husband. Do we see it? So he says, husbands, you've you've got to treat your wife really, really well. Why? Because she is an, next three words, the woman, the wife, the Christian wife, is an heir with him. An heir with him. Depends what translation you've got. You might even have that the wife, the woman, is a joint heir, the husband. Now, (laughs) nothing happens in here when I say that. But you have to understand how, how that would have sounded into the context of the first century world. Like this idea that a woman would be called a joint heir, an heir with a man in the Greco Roman first century setting is that is just radical, revolutionary. And I just want to read you this quote that I read this week, which is scandalous, but it tells you what it was like to be a woman in the first century world prior to first century Christianity. Listen to this. This is how women were viewed in the Greco-Roman world. Ready for it? So women were viewed, now next bit, by nature... A woman was viewed by nature inferior to a man. A woman at the time was viewed as lacking in capacity, ruled by emotion. She was viewed as given to poor judgment. And then this, I think, is almost the worst one here. A woman at the time, the first century world, was viewed as simply untrustworthy. And what happens? In that context, Peter, in line with the rest of Scripture, he speaks of a woman as being a joint heir before God. A woman as being an equal before God, as in in no way inferior to man. So we have to appreciate submission from a scriptural perspective. Listen, submission is not an oppressive action enforced upon an inferior That's how society portrays submission. That is not submission biblically. Submission much more is a willing attitude taken up by an equal party. And lest there be anyone in the room or listening online that doesn't think that that's a biblical portrayal of submission, let me make good on my earlier promise. And let me end this point directing you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you know your Bible, what what does Philippians 2 tell you of Jesus? He saved his people. What does it tell us in Philippians 2? That though he was, listen, in the form of God, so though he was equal with God, equal with the Father, what does he do to save his people? He lowers himself. He submits equal, but submits to his Father's will. If we want to understand the roles in marriage, we don't listen to society, we don't listen to the thoughts of men, primarily we look first to the Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, if we want to understand submission, we look to the cross. So, an examination of submission. Second thing, though, is an effect of submission, an effect of of submission. So so it's problematic. We're not pretending that as we come to this as sinners that it's not problematic. I think part of the issue here is that as the Christian church, we've maybe lost focus and lost sight of how exciting this portion of Scripture is. Like we get caught up in the detail of how troublesome it seems to us, and we miss how just tremendously exciting spiritually this section of Scripture is. I'll tell you what I mean. Imagine this. Imagine that God did not just tell a Christian woman to submit to her husband for the sake of it. 
or just to add color to this metaphor of Christ's relationship with his church. Imagine God did this. Imagine God told a Christian woman to submit to her husband because God had a plan, a purpose. Imagine that. Imagine that God told a woman to do this because God might use, actually use that submission for his glory and for eternal good. Now, if there was a purpose here, if there was a plan, if God could use that, wouldn't it change this? Wouldn't it make it more exciting to us? Well, you look again at verse 1. Verse 1. Wives, be subject to your own husbands, and then there's a purpose clause. So that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. Now, we can see that there's some sort of spiritual change in, in view there. Can we see that? So the, the first thing, I guess, we've got to work out exactly who it is that's in view. Because, you know, confession time again from the minister I got this wrong for a long time. I studied First Peter and still got this completely wrong because the idea is that it's husbands who do not obey the word, right? You can see that that's in view. So uh, me being an idiot, I thought that was the idea of an, just a sort of wayward Christian husband. You know, the idea, like, so the idea here that, you know, he's straying and he's backsliding, but if a wife submits, that'll be used by God to bring him back to faith, right? Maybe, maybe some people in here are, are as daft as me to think of it like that, but, what, but it's not that. Because what, if, what do we know about First Peter now that we've been studying it? That when First Peter, when Peter says the word, he's not referring to all of the Bible, He's not referring to the law. When Peter talks in this epistle about the Word, he's actually talking about the gospel itself, the good news of salvation. So who are these husbands who, are, who disobey the gospel? What are they? What's in view here? It is wives, isn't it, who are married to unbelieving men. That's who's in focus here. Women who, have, who are married to unbelievers, something because of arranged marriages and the conversion of women, something that would have been really quite common in the first century church. So is everyone with me who's in view? It's unbelieving, unbelie women married unbelieving husbands. But then we've got to know what God suggests might happen. So again, just look at it because it's really interesting, isn't it? Look at verse one. So wives submit so that these unbelieving husbands, what does God suggest might happen? They might be, these unbelieving husbands might be one without a word. So do you see, it's not the idea, is it? Like the, these women preach the words and, and use words if you have to. It's not that. Obviously, the husband has to hear about Jesus in order to believe. But I do believe it's this idea that nagging, is not the path of effectiveness in Christian witness. Isn't that what Peter's saying? Saying that, yes, the, the woman has to tell her husband about Jesus, has to tell him the gospel. But when that is done, instead of plaguing him morning, noon, and night to attend church with her, what's the idea? You tell about Jesus, and then you live well, you submit to your husband, and you trust God to bring forth fruit. I, I firmly believe what we could do at this point is think about application for, for all of us if we're Christians in here. Isn't it true that all of us who are Christians in this room watching online, we've got people in our lives that we are genuinely struggling to witness to, aren't we? Genuinely struggling to speak about the Lord Jesus. And what we see in there. We're seeing how we live in that circumstance is so incredibly important. We have to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ, but we have to seek to live biblically amongst those people we're trying to witness to. So yeah, we, we can focus on, on how it applies, generally speaking, to the Christian. But you're with me that this is such a specific, narrow portion of Scripture. So I wonder if you would agree that we need to do this as a church, as Christians, we need to be praying for people who are in that precise situation. You and I need to be praying for Christian women who are married to unbelieving men and vice versa. 
that whatever has caused that, whether it's that woman's fault, whether it was a mistake she has made or not, what does she need but her Christian family interceding for her, pleading with God to help her to live well with her husband, to submit to her husband? And why? How do we get to the cross here? How do we get to Jesus here? Why? What could happen? We see here that God could use that woman's submission to point her unbelieving husband to the cross, to Jesus, bringing glory to his great name. Act of submission to. Thirdly, we see, an, the, sorry, the essence of submission. So if you do this with me, if you cast your mind back to the really tightest part of lockdown, when was that? Oh, I've lost, I've, I don't even know what year it is now because of lockdown, but April probably, right? That was about as tight as it got when it got to lockdown, April or May. So let me ask you to think about what, what did you miss the most at, at lockdown, right in the tightest? It was tough. Like, let's not pretend it wasn't. It was tough for a lot of us. What was the thing that you missed uh, the most? Like, was it the church? I'd love to think that we missed each other. Um, maybe we did. I do pray that we did. Uh, Gwen might have missed Simone on the tightest part of lockdown. Um, what else? We maybe missed travel, some of us, outside spaces probably. Do you know what absolutely amazes me still when I reflect on it? That clearly it was the case that a lot of people in the city, the thing that they missed most was pre-mark. <laughs> Isn't that the case? Because what happened as soon as lockdown began to ease, what happened? Queues. <laughs> People just rushed out. And there was massive queues outside Primark or the Nike shop. And Madonna was right that we live in a material world. Like People are obsessed evidently with how they look and their clothing. Well, if that is the culture that we live in, then what Peter says, what God says in his word next, really could be quite uncomfortable for us and certainly countercultural. Would you do this? Would you read it with me? Have a look at verses 3 and 4. You got it? Verses 3 and 4. Now, you know, let's remember that it's, in a sense, is Peter saying this, but in a sense, this is the Holy Spirit of God saying it says to the, the, the Christian wife, do not let your adorning be external. In the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of your heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. <laughs> it is. It's, you know, in 21st century London, that sounds really... Great, in a sense, it's quite countercultural because of that. Let me just try and do a couple of things with it. First thing we've got to do is try and tie this down really tightly because you know what happens here. People take this teaching and run to the extreme. Isn't that right? Like, you, you know, you'll hear people say that actually what's in view here is that when Christian wives must wear sackcloths. You know, Christian wives they cannot even brush their hair or wash their hair. You know, that's sort of, they take it to an extreme. Now, is that what Peter's saying here? Is not what Peter's saying here. Now, we've got to be careful. We've got to look at the words, but we've also got to consider it in its context in New Testament Scripture, when you do that in 1, Peter, uh, 1 Timothy 2 and so forth, you see the idea is not that women, Christian women cannot wear nice clothes or cannot style their hair. It's the idea that they must not be obsessed with the external things. That's it. It's the calling for the, the Christian wife, the Christian woman, to reject excessively expensive clothing, lavish attire, to reject that in favor of trying to fix up their own heart. So we've got to tie that down pretty tight. But the second thing we maybe have to do is consider some examples of this, because I genuinely pray that there are Christian women in the room right now, and Christian women, especially Christian wives online, who read this, and they're first inclination is, I want to obey your word, O oh God. I pray that that's the case. And I pray in that situation, 
that the Christian woman is thinking, well, how do I do that? How do I follow this? Well, one thing you've got to do is pay attention to verse 6. Because do you see what God does? He gives you an example of follow. Old Testament women, study the Old Testament women. Look at Sarah. She's in a terrible circumstance. She's, she's almost laughing, but she doesn't disrespect her husband. She still submits to him. You're given the Old Testament woman as an example, but I think genuinely there's something more fascinating and more exciting here. What did we say we would do? At each point, we said we would end and look to the Lord Jesus Christ, didn't we? Now, you look at the words, Christian women in here, what are you to, to look after, to follow? You are to seek to have a, what are the words? A gentle heart, a gentle and quiet spirit. Now listen, there is only one place in the whole of the New Testament Scriptures where the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ is described to you. That's a thought, isn't it? So there's only one instance in the whole of the New Testament where the central enemy and core of the Son of God is disclosed and revealed. Do you want to know what is said of Jesus? Matthew 11, you listen. Jesus says this, Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle of heart. I am gentle and lowly of heart. Isn't that amazing? Like, do you see how that in should inform our reading of this portion of Scripture? Christian women in here, what is it that you are doing if you reject an obsession with external things and you focus on submissiveness to your Christian, to your husband? What are you doing? Do you see you're actually following after the Lord Jesus Christ himself? I think that should be motivating, surely. Like, we think of this portion of Scripture as troublesome, and it's oppressive, and it's outdated, but this is a section of Scripture. In its call for submissiveness, in its call for gentleness, this is a portion of Scripture that shows Christian women how to pursue Christ-likeness itself. And then I'll just I'll close with this. The fourth thing is the equivalent to submission, because we're nearly out of the minefield. <laughs> we're navigating this minefield, we're nearly out of the minefield, but there is, I think, there's the danger of an explosion just as we, as we leave the minefield here, because we get into the section to do with husbands. Okay, now, now just an aside, as an aside, I would love to think that we have all worked out have we been here for the sermon series? Have we all worked out why the section for women is larger than the section for men? It's because the concern of the Apostle Peter is always to deal with the party in the relationship that is most likely to be mistreated. Think about it. The citizen. He focuses on the citizen and not the ruler and the governor, doesn't he? Then he goes into the servant, and he focuses on the servant and not the master in that relationship. Now he focuses on largely on the wife and not the husband. His concern is for the party who's most likely to be abused and mistreated. But what does he say? Look at verse 7. What does, do you see why there might be an explosion in here? What does he call the woman, uh, the Christian wife? In verse 7, he calls her the weaker vessel. The weaker vessel. So, ladies, does that rile you? Do you get annoyed by that idea? I, I don't at all uh, think you should be annoyed. The idea is not uh, intellectual weakness. It is not emotional weakness. It cannot be spiritual weakness. The guys at the cross flee the women stay at the resurrection. The guys stay in the home. The women, they come to the tomb. It is not about spiritual weakness. It's biology, isn't it? Peter's simply making a physiological point that a woman is different to a man. And I think far from the women being uncomfortable, I think it should be the men in here I think it should be the Christian husbands in this room and listening online 
who should be sitting awkwardly in their seats because, guys, did you see the warning that God gives us in this verse? I will speak personally. I think I've said this to you before. I find it terrifying in a sense. Look at it, verse 7. Peter says, should husbands not treat their wives well? In fact, the idea, I think, when it's talking about knowledge, is the idea that should the husband not treat the wife through the knowledge he has of God, then what is the warning? That that will have the most detrimental effects on their spiritual lives. Guys, husbands in here, Isn't that an incredible thing? Unless we treat a wife with honor, what happens? Our prayers not heard. The prayers for our unbelieving family and our unbelieving friends and for foreign mission work, the work of the church and our our situations and our health and our employment. These prayers not not heard by God unless we treat our our spouse well in Christ. How it should be not just Christian wives, how it should be Christian husbands, that pursued gentleness in the marital home. And I just, I just, I, I close with this thought. We noticed, didn't we, didn't we, that there's equality spiritually, uh, Christian, uh, husband, Christian, wife, joint heirs. I just want you to see as we end what it is we stand to inherit as Christians. Do you see the, the, the words in verse 7? Take these words with you. It says, We are heirs with you of the grace of life. And if you've been here for this sermon series, you know what Peter's doing. Peter's doing what Peter always, always, always does, and he's looking ahead, thinking eschatologically. Peter's looking at how is he described the day of visitation, the day when salvation will be revealed, the day when the Lord Jesus Christ will be revealed, and what will happen on that day? Christian men, Christian women, Christian boys, Christian girls, Christian husbands, Christian wives. We will be gathered together to stand before the Lord of glory. And because of his righteousness, because of his sin-bearing work, we are set to receive grace. We are set to receive the crown of life and life eternal. On that day, what will happen is that the church of Jesus Christ will meet her groom. The bridegroom will usher his bride into a new and perfect home. What will happen at last? At long, long last, there a bride will go without mistreatment. She will go without any tears or any pain. So until such a time as that, let's try and reclaim this portion of Scripture from misunderstanding. Let us try and pursue Christ-likeness. And let's seek to live with each other in gentleness and love. Friends, let's bow before God and pray. Lord our God, in in moments like this, as we consider your calling upon us, our first thing that we do is we confess our pride. We want to live for ourselves. And so when a husband is told to love sacrificially, it goes against, we rebel against that. When the same is true of a Christian woman, there can be rebellion too, O God. So we ask for help in these matters. Help us not to come with sin. Help us not to come with the eyes of society. Let us instead look to Jesus Christ. Lord God, we pray that you would help us to look there at the cross and see beautiful, beautiful submission, all to ensure the salvation of your bride. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.